and there we go. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Sue. Um, let's see here. Advance the slide. Can everybody hopefully hear me okay? Please uh, let us know if you can't hear me very well. Um, but my name is Naomi Namakata. I'm an assistive technology specialist for the Washington Assistive Tech Program, or WATAP. Um, we're based out of the University of Washington, and I have some slides here that'll talk briefly about the services we provide. Uh, I also manage the I Can Connect program for Washington State, and that is the National Deafblind Equipment Distribution Program. Uh, prior to my time with WATAP, I worked as an AT specialist for the Department of Services for the Blind for over 15 years. So I have quite a bit of experience um, working with blind, low vision, and deafblind individuals and their assistive technology. <clears throat> So the Washington Assistive Technology Program um, is a statewide program. We provide AT resources and expertise to all Washington state residents with disabilities, their family members, and to any professionals serving individuals with disabilities. Our goal is to aid in the decision-making process around AT procurement for employment, education, and independent living. Um, so each state has a federally funded and mandated AT program. They're um, housed in different locations. We're housed at the University of Washington Center for Technology and Disability Studies. And our website is www.watap.org. <clears throat> so WATAP has a number of low cost or free programs that are available <clears throat> to any Washington state uh, resident, and that would include any of you as professionals who are working with someone with a disability. Um, we do free information and referral. You can always call us for any information about AT devices, equipment, or services. Um, we also do free device demonstration. Uh, we can't travel for device demonstration, which makes it a little bit challenging for a statewide program. Um, if you can come to us in our Seattle office, we're based um, in the university district. That's great. We can show you any of the devices we have. We could do a Zoom meeting. We can mail you the device and kind of talk you through it over the phone. Um, you know, we're uh, open to exploring different ways um, for device demonstrations across the state. We do do a lot of travel around the state for different presentations and trainings that we provide. So we can often line up a device demo with one of those trips as well. Um, we also have a device lending program. There is a, a fee associated with that program and I'll cover that information in the next slide. But again, all our programs and services are inclusive to all Washington State residents. Um, we can do other services um, such as formal evaluations that require a report and recommendations on AT equipment, as well as professional trainings um, as a fee for service. So you can contact, about, or contact us about that as well. So to borrow a device, you can go to our website and click on borrow a device and it'll take you to this web page that is pictured here. Um, you can create a user account and um, basically look through our um, inventory to see what kind of equipment we have. Um, if there's anything you're interested in, you can borrow it from us for three to five weeks. We say three weeks um, for things that are in high demand that might have a wait list, um, but typically most of our equipment is available for a five week loan. Sometimes we can even extend that uh, on a case by case basis. The loan cost is 10 to $50 and that really just depends on the expense of shipping and the overall cost of the equipment. So something like an ergonomic keyboard would be more like $10, whereas $50 might be <clears throat> a laptop with Dragon, naturally speaking, or JAWS software on it. Um, we will ship anywhere in Washington State and provide a return uh, shipping label. 
And really, you know, the purpose of this um, lending library is so that you have an opportunity to try out the equipment for yourself in your own environment. So if you're working with a student who, you know, is interested in a braille device, um, they could borrow the equipment to use with their computer or their device and see if it's a good fit for them. Um, you can also borrow equipment, um, maybe when something goes in for repair. So again, if a braille display has to go in, you know, for a few weeks to be repaired, we could also loan you something um, during the interim. Let's see, uh, reutilized AT, we organized the Evergreen Reuse Coalition and it's a statewide network for reuse activities. So if you visit the link in this screen, which is um, in our, on our WATAP website, you can click on device reuse and it'll list all of our reuse partners. Um, <clears throat> so there's, um, you know, a lot of durable medical equipment. Um, we also partner with the Speech, Hearing, and Deaf Center in Seattle for reutilized hearing aids or reused hearing aids. And there's also information about organizations that do um, loaned or reused uh, video magnifiers. The I Can Connect program is, um, again, the National Deafblind Equipment Distribution Program. And the purpose of the program is to provide uh, individuals with both significant hearing and vision loss with free equipment and training for distance communication. So this is an FCC uh, funded program which exists in all states. In Washington state, WATAP partners with the Perkins School for the Blind in Massachusetts to provide these services. They manage the database and they, um, they order equipment and things like that for us. Um, and we focus more on the surface provision. So you can find more uh, information about the program and uh, you can also find the application for the program at iconconnect.org. Um, the disability eligibility requirements are significant vision loss combined with significant hearing loss. Um, you can also have a progressive condition in either of those areas. So for example, in the Seattle area, there's a very large Usher's syndrome population. Um, you know, depending on the type of Usher's you have, you can be born deaf. Um, the vision, uh, the eye condition is always retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative or progressive condition. So someone might not quite qualify with the visual acuity of 2200 or a field um, restriction of less than 20 degrees yet, but because their condition is progressive, um, they would qualify for our services. Um, the income eligibility is within 400% of the poverty level. So this year, one person household is uh, 51,000, two person is almost 69,000 and it just goes up from there in terms of the number of people in the household. Um, you can be automatically eligible if um, you can show proof that you're enrolled in Medicaid, SSI, Section 8, SNAP, and the Veterans and Survivors Pension Benefit. So the equipment we can provide through this program is pretty significant. Um, pretty much any kind of computer, um, Windows or Mac, desktop or laptop. Um, we can provide any of the assistive technology that would go with the equipment. Um, so we can do, um, you know, Zoom text or JAWS. Uh, we can provide Braille displays if they need Braille for use with their computers. Um, or we can also provide um, <clears throat> any of the iOS or Android devices. Um, we do some landlines and amplified phones. Uh, we also provide um, signalers um, for use with those devices. Um, the equipment is for distance communication again, so not face-to-face -face communication, but anything um, where you're communicating from a distance like um, email, text messaging, phone calling, uh, video relay, um, 
internet and social media are also considered distance communication tasks. Um, so we, you know, we can provide equipment for individuals who would use it for personal communication, but they can also use the equipment for school and um, employment if needed. Uh, we just can't provide the equipment specifically for, you know, school or work tasks. Um, we can also provide up to 30 hours of training on each device, um, sometimes more as needed. So it's pretty significant level of training. Um, we will also troubleshoot, replace, maintain the equipment typically after three years if the equipment is no longer functioning or meeting the person's needs, we'll just replace it. Um, and as long as an individual continues to qualify for the program um, via income or disability requirements, they can receive services. So it's actually pretty easy to reapply for services. Um, <clears throat> we only need income verification again if we're providing new equipment. So if someone comes back and you know they are using an iPhone with iOS 12, and they recently upgraded to iOS 13 and can't figure out how to perform some of the same tasks, um, we can go ahead and provide them with additional training on iOS 13 without having to um, look at their income documentation again. So moving on from the resources, just quickly, the prevalence of vision loss uh, in the US, 25.5 million adults age 18 and older, so about 10%, uh, report vision loss according to the 2016 National Health Interview Survey. 81% um, of those people who are blind or have moderate or severe vision loss are age 50 years and older. So it's definitely um, affecting the older generation more. Um, according to the 2017 American Community Survey, there are about 568,202 children with vision difficulty in the US. So vision terminology, um, you know, visual acuity is what you always hear is 2020, which is normal vision. Um, anytime the number on the bottom goes up, um, that means your visual acuity goes down. So um, 2200 is um, the visual acuity that would qualify for um, legal blindness. Um, your visual field is your central and peripheral vision uh, combined. Um, an easy test for visual field is if you extend your arms on either side of um, in either side of you and um, you look straight ahead and you point your index finger up as soon as you start to be able to see your fingers that's kind of um, where your visual field begins. <clears throat> so individuals who are legally blind um, or can be legally blind if they have a visual field of 20 degrees or less um, their acuity still might be 20-20 um, but you know, significant portion of their visual field is missing. Um, photophobia is the technical term for um, light sensitivity. Uh, most people who have um, an eye condition have some level of photophobia. Common eye disorders, refractive errors, you know, such as myopia, hyperopia, stigmatism, you know, these can be corrected uh, with glasses typically. And so they, you know, you might say, oh, I'm 2200 without my glasses on, but that does not mean that you're legally blind. Um, if um, the measurement of legal blindness um, is related to the best corrected vision. Um, cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, Stargardt's, um, hemianopia. These are all different eye conditions um, that are probably the more common eye conditions out there. Um, and really, um, while the vision for these individuals might vary pretty dramatically depending on uh, the vision they have, you know, the AT solutions are going to be 
somewhat similar. Um, and we'll cover these um, topics today. So glare reduction um, and lighting and contrast, magnifiers, uh, magnification and screen reading software, braille displays and tactile graphics, apps and notification watches, um, and other devices. So lighting and glare. Um, I have a few pictures here which I will describe, but um, you know, one easy way to deal with lighting and glare is to use glare shields or glare glasses. In the top left corner, there's a photo of three boys wearing glasses that have varying colors of lenses. And there are just a really significant range of um, colored filters for glasses out there. So I do recommend that if someone needs glare reduction um, or contrast improvement that they um, see a low vision specialist to be assessed. Um, typically lenses that are more yellow in color improve contrast, whereas the more amber colored lenses um, combat glare. And there are different color combinations that kind of um, can do both for you depending on your eye condition. Um, another really simple way to deal with glare um, from overhead lighting is to wear a baseball cap and that's this cute little boy that has a baseball cap on um, that says best kid ever. Um, so, you know, if a student is having issues with the fluorescent lighting in their classroom, then, um, you know, wearing a baseball cap and maybe some glare shields for contrast um, could be a good solution for them. In terms of changing the environment, you can, um, I like the, the blinds that allow for some light filtering, so you're not completely, um, you know, cutting off all of the light, but you're able to control the filtering of the light depending on, you know, how um, opaque the shields are, the blinds are. Uh, there are also a lot of different cube shields available. So if someone is working um, in sort of a cubicle environment or classroom environment where you can attach some kind of filter to a surface, um, there's a lot of options out there available. So if you're cutting down the general lighting in an area, it's also very important to have task lighting. Um, I recommend lights that have a lot of flexibility in their positioning. So the two that I have listed or pictured here, one has a big long arm um, so that you can really um, move the light around so that it's directly on your working surface and you're not kind of mitigating the effects of the glare from the lighting on any of your other you know, devices, uh, maybe your monitors. There's also another task lamp here that folds down. It's, um, it can be battery operated and so you can kind of move it around with you as needed. There's a woman reading her newspaper pictured here. Um, the other thing to consider with lighting is the color of the light. There's, um, you know, really big range of um, what they call color temperature <clears throat> from warm, which is kind of that amber sort of um, yellowish light all the way up to the <clears throat> very cool lights, which are more, um, more blue. Um, you can also get bulbs that are um, similar to natural light. Um, outdoor light. So depending on the individual and their eye condition, they might have a preference or see better under um, different temperature lights. Um, contrast, here I have pictured the two most common high contrast schemes. So we have high contrast black, or sometimes it's called reverse contrast, where you have a black background with light colored text, either white, um, yellow, or green tends to be the most popular. Um, high contrast white would be the opposite where you have a white background with very dark text on top. Um, 
this is one of the first things that I typically look at on a device with somebody because it makes such a huge difference in their ability to access the screen. Um, a lot of the um, devices now like a PC, Mac and <clears throat> your smart phones and tablets have at least a high contrast black setting. And so if you notice somebody, you know, kind of squinting at the screen or you know, they say they have issues with, um, with brightness. Um, I would certainly look at one of the high contrast um, black color schemes. So moving on to magnifiers, um, you know, a good first step for low vision is looking at optical magnifiers and monoculars. Um, you might not be aware, but without a low vision specialist or an optometrist recommendation, you can't get very high powered magnifiers. Um, so if on Amazon you see uh, an, a product that claims to have 20x magnification, uh, most likely that's false advertising. Um, the more magnification you get, also the smaller the field of view is. So, you know, a 20x magnifier would actually have a pretty small lens. Um, monoculars are great for um, distance viewing, um, but short-term distance viewing. So if a student, you know, needed something to read um, street signs or, um, you know, door numbers or something like that. Um, a monocular is a great, easy, simple tool. Um, if they're needing to do more extensive reading in the distance, then, um, um, you know, they would probably opt for a different solution like a video magnifier. Now, a bioptic lens, which is pictured here in the bottom right, is the distance. Um, distance magnification mounted on glasses. So these are customized solutions for an individual. Um, in Washington State, you are able to drive with bioptic lenses. Um, and, you know, they could be a good uh, option for someone who needs to, you know, attend trainings or do some limited distance um, reading. Video magnifiers or CCTVs are kind of the next step after the optic, um, the optical magnification products. The cost range really varies. I mean, they can be anywhere from three hundred to four thousand dollars, and typically, you know, the more basic, the smaller, the less features, the less expensive. Um, so. Um, I have three pictured here. On the top left, there's the LVI Magnolink Zip, and this is a typical desktop uh, video magnifier. So it's going to have a table where you can place your reading material, and then everything that you need to do will be magnified up onto a screen. And you can change the magnification, you can change the contrast, some of the higher end ones also can capture um, the text on a page and read it to you. So for someone who's stationary and doing a lot of reading, um, that's typically the best option. Um, on the right is the Enhanced Vision Transformer. And this is kind of a category of devices where you can, where it gives you more flexibility. And typically they're kind of geared towards students. Um, it has a camera on an arm and the camera can be rotated down to look at your desk surface to read a textbook or a handout or whatever it is, um, some kind of paper document or object. And then the camera can be turned up so that you could read the board. Um, typically, these devices can be connected to a tablet, um, a laptop, a monitor. So you know, student has a variety of different um, methods for accessing um, accessing the large print or the large the magnified material. Um, 
the Freedom Scientific Ruby, um, which is pictured on the bottom center. So I'm going to turn down my ringer there. Sorry about that. Um, this is a category of handheld uh, video magnifiers. They come in anywhere from a three to a 10 inch screen, and they're really made to be portable and um, used for spot reading. So a lot of people take them uh, around to grocery stores um, or to restaurants to read um, menus and that kind of thing. So they'd be sufficient for um, reading, you know, a couple handouts in a classroom, but certainly not for accessing a textbook. Um, IPVO is a company out of Taiwan and they make document cameras. Um, and they have one, um, the VZX, for $300, which is actually a good low cost CCTV. Um, it does, you know, document reading, not distance viewing. So it's, it would be more limited to uh, textbooks and um, paper documents and so forth. Um, but it's wireless, um, so you can connect it to an iPad or a tablet device. Um, it's also um, HDMI and USB compatible, so you can connect it to a laptop or a monitor as well. Um, it has the ability to take pictures and record video, and it also has a built-in LED light um, to light up the document that you're looking at. Um, the APH Mac Connect um, is $3,000 and it's basically an Android tablet which has been adapted um, for near and distance viewing. Um, it's pretty low profile, which I think a lot of students would appreciate. Um, it has a camera that is made for distance viewing that's kind of attached on this pole so that you can see, you know, the whiteboard um, or a screen in the distance. Um, and then it uses the camera on the tablet for any of the near distance reading um, of textbooks and paper documents. It also has built-in OCR, so you can actually take a picture of printed material and have it read to you. Um, and it also has the Google Apps, um, Dropbox, and an ebook reader installed so that um, you can use the same device for some um, productivity as well. And I think this is available through SETC the last time I checked for loans, so you can probably verify that. Um, so if it's a device that you think one of your students might benefit from, um, you can borrow it to try out from SETC. And I neglected to mention earlier when I was talking about the lending program for WATAP that a lot of these devices are available for loan. Um, from WATAP as well. So um, you could contact us um, if you're interested in trying any of them out. Um, so I put this in here. Another method for electronic whiteboard access um, would be to use some kind of remote um, software. Um, there's Doceri, Splashtop, Screen Stream, Join Me, or some of the options out there, but you know, this way a student could actually see an electronic whiteboard or the display of the electronic whiteboard on their device. Um, one challenge I've heard is that sometimes IT has um, an issue with this because they're concerned about the security. So that is something to consider when you talk about implementing or trying this out with your student. So moving on to computer, tablet, and smartphone access. Um, screen magnification. Now there's a lot of screen magnification products out there and the cool thing is that a lot of them are, are just operating systems of the devices so you don't have to purchase a third party um, program. Uh, Microsoft Magnifier is decent. Um, you know, if someone only needs three to four X magnification or so, um, it does a pretty good job. Once you start to get higher into higher levels of mag 
application, the image quality does deteriorate. Um, Microsoft in their latest, let's see, in last year's Windows 10 update, uh, made a lot of changes um, to their pointer um, options. So you can actually, you have significantly more control over your pointer size and you can also change the color of it. Um, Zoom text magnifier reader is kind of been the standard for PC for magnification. It also has a reader. So, you know, if someone experiences um, eye fatigue, which is pretty common for low vision users, um, they might have a reader so that they can listen to, you know, that article on Wikipedia or their emails um, rather than reading it visually. Um, it's also a great tool for editing documents or emails as well so that you can kind of visually follow along but also hear um, any of the errors in your documents. Um, I have had some issues lately with Zoom text. Um, the reliability and you know some of the navigation um, function has been a little bit um, problematic for some of my users. So another option out there is Dolphin Supernova Magnifier Reader and Dolphin is out of the UK and their, um, their products are more popular in Europe. Um, but they also have a magnifier reader um, um, software program and it's a little bit less expensive than Zoom text. And at ATIA um, earlier this year, I saw it demonstrated on a PC with a touch screen monitor and it was awesome. I mean, it really, um, you know, you could do a pinch zoom anywhere on your, in any application, you could just use one finger to kind of pan around the screen. I was, I was really impressed. There wasn't any lag time. So, you know, someone who prefers a, touch screen environment on a PC might really benefit from um, Dolphin Supernova. Um, so for iOS and Mac, Zoom and the speak selection or speak screen um, functions are built into the accessibility features. Um, so definitely check those out if you haven't already. Um, Magnifier is the Android version of Zoom. Um, and actually some of the gestures with magnifier are pretty good. It also does a pinch zoom and a two finger um, pan, which is kind of nice. Um, the iOS zoom requires a three finger pan, which I think can be kind of cumbersome on a small screen like an iPhone. Um, Chromebook also has a magnifier built in that is available in Chrome OS and it does a you know, decent job uh, Magnif uh, magnifying up to, again, you know, three, four, five X or so. So one thing to consider with magnification is the higher magnification levels will affect the field of view um, for a user um, and can impact their orientation to the screen. So, you know, if you're only seeing a quarter of the content on the screen at a time, um, it really takes some training and discipline to, um, you know, pan the entire screen um, and make sure you're not missing any content. Um, I would say if someone is using 8 to 10x level of magnification, um, you know, at that point I would consider adding on a screen reader, um, especially if they have a progressive um, eye condition. Um, most people at 8 to 10x have a really hard time um, being efficient with magnification only. So with magnification, um, you also want to consider monitors or screen size. Um, the larger the monitor, the less magnification is needed. So 2x on a 10-inch screen is going to be significantly smaller than 2x on a 27-inch screen. So someone might be able to use less magnification with a larger monitor. 
I always recommend an arm for the monitor when it's um, possible um, in order for the user to, you know, be able to position the monitor in an ergonomic height, distance. Some people who, um, some users with um, different eye conditions might require a very close focal distance. Um, so the monitor arm helps them bring the, the monitor very close to them or closer to them as needed. Um, you know, depending on the eye condition, however, if someone has reduced visual fields or again, a very close focal distance, I've seen people who, you know, have to be about three or four inches away from the screen to um, read the text. A large monitor can require too much increased head and movement. Um, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind when you're recommending the monitor. So screen readers. Um, screen readers are made for individuals who cannot visually access the screen. So they are entirely keyboard driven and they're very verbose. Um, I worked with someone who was low vision, but really her primary disability was um, learning disability. And she was given JAWS and it was just, you know, making her crazy because it just provided way too much information for her. So using a screen reader because it's keyboard driven and requires the knowledge of a lot of keystrokes, um, it requires a significant amount of training in order to be um, proficient with it. Um, if someone is using a braille display, they're using a screen reader as well because the screen reader is what drives a braille display. Um, and some of the higher end screen readers um, like JAWS or Supernova um, are customizable so you can actually script, uh, write scripts for them um, if they're not working in you know, some kind of proprietary application. It's not really an ideal fix because as the software changes or gets updated, you know, that can sometimes break the scripts. Um, but it is, you know, an option um, for these higher end products. So JAWS for Windows is still pretty much the gold standard for folks who are, um, needing to use a computer or PC for high productivity. So if you're employed or you're in college, um, you're most likely going to be using JAWS. Um, they now have a subscription plan, so you can pay $90 a year or you can buy the product outright for $1,000. Um, Supernova um, is made by Dolphin um, out of the UK and they have a screen reader um, as well, which is $11.95. Their screen reader also comes automatically with magnification, which I think is why it's a little bit higher priced. Um, NVDA for PC is free and it's quite good. In fact, um, it might work better in certain um, programs than JAWS. I know for a while it was working better with the Google apps than JAWS was. So a lot of um, screen reader users were actually running JAWS and NVDA um, on the same system, kind of alternating between the two, depending on what kind of tasks they were needing to accomplish. Um, Microsoft has worked really hard on Windows Narrator. Um, so they uh, really have improved it to the point where someone could functionally use Narrator on their PC for basic tasks. So if someone just really wanted to check email and, um, you know, do some word processing and maybe do some browsing on the internet, they could do that with Narrator. Did test it with uh, PowerPoint the other day when I was looking at this, um, at this presentation and it did not work very well. So it may not work quite yet with some of the Office programs. Um, for a Mac and iOS, VoiceOver, which is built in, is the only option available and it's very good. It's very robust. Uh, VoiceOver on a Mac is 
um, pretty different than JAWS or the screen readers for uh, Windows. And so, again, it will require um, a significant amount of training to master. I kind of think it's actually an easier learning curve because there's not as many keystrokes to learn. Um, but the interaction, I think, kind of requires an extra level of keystrokes, which might um, be problematic or just frustrating for some users who are used to JAWS. The benefit, of course, of using a Mac with voiceover is that the screen reader comes with the computer, so you're not worrying about having to purchase additional software or upgrade your software every year. Um, and Android has TalkBack, um, which is made by Google for uh, Android devices. Some of the Android devices, like the Samsung devices, have their own screen reader, which um, get what the voiceover or the screen reader for Samsung is made based on an older version of TalkBack. Um, so it's a little bit confusing. Um, when you go into the accessibility settings, you actually have to download TalkBack from the Play Store separately in order to use TalkBack instead of the Samsung screen reader. Um, all right, so moving on to Braille and tactile graphics. So I will get on my soapbox very quickly here, but you know, for students who can't see print, can't see the alphabet, Braille is literacy. Um, in 1960, over 50% of students who are blind were literate in Braille. Um, according to a recent poll conducted by the American Printing House for the Blind, only 8.5% of blind students now I, um, are identified as Braille readers. So that is a huge change. And there um, are studies that show relationship between success in college and uh, ability to use Braille. So the benefits of Braille, um, you don't have to use the audio of a screen reader, you can mute it. So in a classroom environment, you're not having to listen to your screen reader in one year and uh, listen to your teacher or professor in the other year. Um, it provides spatial information that a screen reader doesn't provide. So if you imagine a Braille display um, or a Word document and say, you know, your title is centered, on a Braille display, the text will uh, be centered on the Braille display or it'll be um, moved in a certain number of spaces so that, you know, a Braille reader will know that, oh, this, you know, this line of text is not left aligned. Whereas on, for a screen reader user, um, you know, as you're reading, you can't, you don't get that information. You have to actually ask JAWS to tell you um, that information. Um, you can edit documents much more easily as well. So um, if you're reading through, you know, whatever, an email that you compose, if you find a spelling error or grammatical error, you can actually move the, the cursor of your computer directly to that location where the error is and make the correction. Um, it's much more efficient than using a, a screen reader to do that. Um, there is Nemeth code, which is Braille for math. So this allows students to read math problems and um, in Braille write the answers to the math problems so they can interact with the Braille or with the math. Um, and then there's also Braille code uh, for music for someone who wants to read music. So refreshable Braille displays, I have pictured here a Freedom Scientific Focus 45th generation. And, you know, the Braille displays need to be used um, with a device that is running a screen reader. Um, each cell or eight dot configuration or block on a Braille display um, is one character. So there's 
a variety of different sizes of Braille displays, um, anywhere from 14 cells to 80 cells. Uh, 40 cells is the standard for productivity, so most um, college students and um, folks who are working um, use a 40 cell Braille display. Um, above the Braille display, um, there's on this picture, you can see there's eight <clears throat> blue uh, buttons that are actually um, for input of text. And so it kind of, um, it's called the Perkins Braille keys, but you use the brailing, um, the Braille code basically to input text on a device. Um, most devices can be connected um, via Bluetooth um, and or USB, and the price ranges from $695 to $6,000. Typically, you know, the more cells, the more expensive the device is. So a few new and upcoming Braille displays. The HIMSS Q Braille XL uh, is $31.95, and it's it's unique because it has 40, um, a 40 cell braille displays with the Perkins keys in the middle for input, but it also has all of the QWERTY function keys. So it's um, hard to see on this uh, image, but you know, across the top you have escape and then your F1 through F12 keys. Um, down along the bottom, you have your control function uh, windows and alts and spacebar keys. So it um, is really great for individuals who are using a screen reader like JAWS because you can essentially use the same keystrokes on this device that you could use um, on a QWERTY keyboard. So it sort of eliminates the need for a QWERTY keyboard um, for individuals using this device. So, you know, Alt F4 is the keystroke to close an application, and that would be the same um, on this device as well. And the next slide here, there's two products coming out from the American Printing House. One is a Braille display that has a QWERTY keyboard on it, um, which is, um, there aren't any available out there on the market right now that are similar. It's supposed to be 2000 or less. They also have the Chameleon 20, which is a 20 cell braille display. Um, it's really meant for students um, so that they're able to um, kind of learn braille on a display. I believe it will be a thousand dollars or less. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip over the slide here. Just this is a braille note taker, um, which is very popular um, for use in school districts kind of an all-in-one device. Um, tactile graphics, um, with the advent of 3D printers, um, there's, you know, really a great way to depict something like the US map here um, in 3D rather than just on um, an embossed or brailled um, piece of paper. Um, you know, you can use 3D in order to, on this, image here, it's showing populations, um, how tall the state is. So California and New York are quite tall. So is Texas compared with some of the other states. So moving to apps, I just quickly um, put in voice control for iOS 13 here because um, it really allows a user to um, use their, um, their iPhone or iPad um, similar to Dragon in that you can um, use voice control for navigation and dictation and it can be used with voiceover. Um, if you haven't explored the iOS shortcut app, it's pretty cool. It's a way to automate a series of tasks, kind of like a macro. Um, there's a gallery of pre-made shortcuts that you could choose from, um, or you can create your own, which is, can be kind of complicated. Um, and if you have a programming background, that is definitely beneficial. Um, but for example, you can create one that says, um, let's scan QR codes. So you can either um, 
touch the shortcut that you place on your home screen or you can tell Siri to scan a QR code and it automatically opens the camera window so that you can just go ahead and scan the code. Um, Seeing AI is made by Microsoft and it's iOS only, it's an iOS only app and it's free and it does just a ton of things with the camera. So you can read, um, it'll read aloud text for you. Um, as soon as you place the camera over some printed text, it'll read it. It'll scan barcodes. It can recognize people that you save, or you can also take pictures of people and it'll give you an estimate of their age, gender, and emotions. Um, they have some scene um, functions where it can give you a description of the scenes that doesn't seem to work very well. Um, same with the handwriting. It does have a beta for the handwriting uh, recognition, but that, that doesn't seem that effective. I guess it depends on the, you know, how nice your handwriting is, but I definitely recommend downloading it and checking it out if you have um, an iOS device. KNFB Reader is a $90, $99, basically a $100 app for iOS, Android, or Windows, and it's basically an OCR program. It's gonna take a picture of text and read it to you. Um, you can export it and save it. So, you know, it could be a nice way for someone to capture um, a lengthy document and review. Um, you can also review it with um, Braille output, which is nice for Braille users. So notification devices, um, Apple Watch is the gold standard, has voiceover, Zoom, bold text, um, tactile or haptic notifications, so it'll vibrate and let you know, um, you know when you get a notification. Um, the Samsung Galaxy watches also have accessibility built in. So if someone's using an Android device, um, you can use uh, Voice Assistant, which is the Samsung screen reader, high contrast zoom. Um, it also has the vibrating notifications. Um, the Dot Watch is $4.95 and it is a Braille watch. So someone who wants to read Braille, um, and use this device um, and read their notifications in Braille. It also vibrates. Um, in the Xiaomi Mi Band um, is, I put this in here because someone may just benefit from a basic notification. Device. They wanna know if their phone is ringing or if they're getting a text message. Um, this is $26.99 um, on Amazon and it works with iOS and Android. Um, I am running out of time, so I have five minutes. So I'm going to speed through this last section. I apologize. And again, if you need a copy of um, the slideshow, um, just please let me know and we're happy to distribute it. Um, smart speakers, super accessible um, for a blind low vision population, you know, setting reminders and alarms, checking schedule, your schedule, adding events, um, reading your Kindle books out loud. Um, you know, they're all great um, functions of smart speakers, hands-free calling. Um, the WeWalk Smart Cane is um, part of this new release of these um, canes that use sonar to give you some, or devices that use sonar to give you some information about your um, environment. And so definitely, take a look at this video um, and see what it's all about. Um, there's a talking graphing calculator, the TI-84+. Plus. This is great for students, you know, because they can follow along in a classroom in a math class um, with their peers because all the buttons are the same. There is a talking lab quest as well. So for um, um, you know, science classes and things when they want to get a pH reading or anything like that, um, this device will talk for them. Uh, an LCD microscope from Pentaview has a screen so that someone with low vision could view it on a screen, ra screen rather than um, 
seeing uh, the information or what they're looking at magnified through a scope. Um, the OrCam, we have this um, at WATAP, but it is an OCR um, reader which is mounted to a pair of glasses. And so you can um, see in one of these pictures here, she's pointing to a label on a box and it's reading to her um, whatever she's pointing at. Um, Ira is, um, it's actually pretty cool. Basically they're either smart glasses or an app on your phone connects to a live um, person or assistant who will provide you with information um, um, based on what they're seeing in the camera. And so a lot of people use this for travel. I know, um, you know, someone was telling me they had a meet, they had a meeting in one of the downtown Seattle buildings. And, you know, once you get in those buildings, you don't know what, where the bank of elevators is that you need to take to your specific floor, um, all of that. And she could use Ira in order to navigate. A lot of people also use it for an accessible material that they might um, receive at work. If it's a PDF that's not reading, you could use Ira in order to have someone read it to you. So um, pretty cool. I think they're expanding so that um, they're trying to have universities sign up for this service so that any student um, can access um, that service for free. Um, this is just a list of resources. Um, lots of information about assistive technology for blind and low vision folks and these websites. Um, the flying tech or the flying blind tech tidbits is a nice um, sort of email um, that you can subscribe to where you get all of the latest and greatest information about blind low vision AT. And <laughs> I have two minutes for questions. Um, so does anyone have any questions? See it looks like Kathleen Schaefer has her hand up. Kathleen, um, let me see if I can make it so you can talk. Can you talk to us, Kathleen? Uh, hello? No. <laughs> Just one second. Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't able to use the chat box, but um, Sorry, it, it's it's disabled, but okay. uh, but I would. Sorry, it's been disabled, but uh, I would like uh, a copy of the slides if possible. It's so uh, they're so they're excellent, so much knowledge. Oh, thank you. Yes, of course. And uh, my uh, other question is: Is there any? Uh, uh, ideal light lighting for vision health, you know, the what kind of light bulbs are the best to help preserve uh, the health of the eyes? Yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, there's a lot of studies that show that blue light causes eye fatigue. Um, and, um, you know, even in your iPhone, there's the ability to, you know, have a night view or night mode on where your screen is more of a yellow tone to cut out some of the blue light. Um, I don't know that there is necessarily a specific color um, for eye health. I don't know. A lot of people tend to prefer the full spectrum kind of um, sunlight type of light bulb. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I have another question too, quick question. Let's say uh, a young student uh, presents in a district with uh, visual and hearing, significant visual and hearing impairment. Mm -hmm. Where would be the place to start? And <laughs> um, if they, I would say that if they qualify for the I Can Connect program, that is, I would definitely refer um, them to apply for that program, have their parents apply um, or themselves. Um, we can provide a lot of equipment and training. We do an evaluation as well. Um, 
you know, it's really deaf blind is a whole different um, area in terms of assistive technology and assessment. And so I do recommend um, that you, that that person be evaluated by an A2 specialist um, to really figure out what kinds of accommodations would best meet their needs. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Another question. Okay. I don't know. Sue, can you help me with <laughs> this interface? Yeah, I'm trying to, I was trying to open, um, it looked like we had one more person that maybe raised their hand. And yes, I, can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you, first of all, for an excellent presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I have a question about the we, we Walk Smart Cane versus <laughs> Sunu. Are you familiar with Sunu, which also uses echolocation or sonar? Yes. Would you, could you compare the two? Um, you know, the, the We Walk Cane has the sonar built into the cane itself. I think if you watch the video, you would get a pretty good idea of what the difference is, but um, you basically screw on this piece to the top of the cane with the wee walk. So as you're moving um, your cane, you're getting that, um, that feedback that, um, about your environment on the cane itself, rather than on you know, your wrist, like the Sunu band. Um, some of the, I would say, and I am not an orientation mobility special, uh, specialist, though that's mobility is not my area of expertise, but um, I will say that devices like the Sunu band have a little more flexibility in where you're um, kind of aiming. You could probably get a wider um, field of um, information from the Sunu band versus the WeWalk cane, um, you know, because again, the sensor is on the cane itself. So it's only picking up, you know, cane height and where you're moving your cane. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. And we do have a Sunu, we don't have a WeWalk cane, but we do have a Sunu band. So if that was something that you were interested in trying with someone, you could borrow that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, and I have my email up here on this last slide. Um, so feel free to email me if you have any other questions that come up. You can also just contact WATAP, um, our general phone number, and ask for me. All right. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day and week. Thank you very much, Naomi. We appreciate you coming and um, doing a webinar today for us. And uh, maybe we'll uh, have some people that are interested in borrowing some equipment from WATAP based on your recommendations. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye.